Hello to all of the uh, loyal and enthusiastic Smoke on Go followers. We have a very special person uh, that we're interviewing today, and that is Pierre Carter. And for those of you that don't know what his great achievement was, it was being the first person to legally paraglide off the slopes of uh, Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. And uh, uh, here today is Pierre to tell us all about it, and I'm sure you're going to find it very, very interesting. So, hello to you, Pierre, all 56 years uh, old of you, and still jumping off mountains, the objective being to uh, have jumped off the uh, highest mountain in each and every uh, uh, continent. continent that we have. And uh, all I can say is congratulations on what you achieved jumping off uh, Everest. Well done, and uh, uh, the, the entire fraternity, aviation fraternity, salutes you for your achievement. So welcome here, and uh, we look forward to chatting to you. Great. Well, thanks very much, Scully. Great to be here, and uh, yeah, let's dive right in. And uh, it was a great adventure, and uh, I hope I can get it across to the viewers, sort of what we went through to, I'm to sure achieve you will. that. Yeah. But I, I believe the most traumatic aspect of this entire project was getting the approval, because there, there are people that have jumped off Everest from lower heights, far lower heights, but you were the first person to actually get this rubber stamped and, uh, and, and also to be given a maximum height that you could jump from. Is that correct? That's correct. There have been, so there's three, I was the fourth person to ever fly from 8,000 meters, um, and they allowed me to fly, and, and to get that rubber stamped uh, took uh, my friend Dawa Stephen Sherpa, who runs Asian Trekking, it took him months of negotiation. Uh, I think he's, he's been trying for a couple of years to get uh, permission, and he finally uh, managed to get it for me, luckily. Um, but uh, before that, there was uh, a Frenchman, uh, a Nepalese, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, two Frenchmen and one Nepalese, uh, people that have flown uh, from the summit or just below the summit, like, like I did. Um, so, yeah, so I'm effectively the fourth. And then there have been a, a handful of people who have flown, uh, like, from 6,000 meters uh, from, from the first camp and second camp and, and from various shoulders from, from Everest. Um, but the big thing is getting the perm permission to do it. The others got into trouble. Uh, some of them uh, got fined. Some of them just got a slap on the wrist. And I wanted to try and open it up for uh, other paragliders to fly in, in Nepal. And by showing the authorities we can do it responsibly, we hopefully have set a precedent now and right. other people can now take yeah. it forward. Yeah. And they put a blanket limit of 8,000 meters on this. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That's correct. And I, I don't know why they did that. They wouldn't tell us why. I don't know if I'd offered them. I, I heard that it's on the Chinese uh, Nepalese border and they didn't want to have to get permission from the Chinese because you're taking off pretty much right on their land as well. And, and the Chinese are very fussy about flying um, in, in their part of the world. So I think they might have just limited it because of that or they wanted more money. Right. And I set a limit. Enough's uh, enough. Yeah, we set a limit at 5,000, and that yes. was it. Uh, yeah. Now, 8,000 meters equates to almost 26,000 feet. Yeah. And at 26,000 feet, having, having been an airliner, airline pilot for such a long time, uh, there, there were many sectors that I flew at uh, 26,000 feet, and I would uh, look at the temperature gauge and see what the temperature the temperature was yeah. outside, and it frighteningly, frighteningly cold, and uh, and also uh, on many occasions, uh, winds, uh, winds and jet streams of uh, mm. between 120 and 150 knots. Yeah, yeah. You only have to know what that equates to in kilometers per hour, but very, very strong winds, very low temperatures, and there you went right up to 26,000 feet, which would have been at the bottom of the Hillary Step. 
just, just below, probably, Hillary's probably 400 meters below the Hillary Step or 500 meters. So I was 800 meters from the actual top of Everest, right. the South Coal. Uh, so Everest is eight, 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 almost eight, nine uh, th thousand meters. So what's that, 29,000 feet, I think. So I Correct. was roughly 3,000 meters Correct. below that. Uh, and that Hillary Step is the gateway to the final leg that you need to hike to get yeah. to the, uh, the summit That's of correct, Mount yeah. Everest. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it, the, the, it's often congested with the number of people that are up there. Yeah, so it goes up, uh, it's like a pyramid, the last pyramid you've got, the last sort of 800 meters is this big pyramid. And you walk up the one side of the pyramid, eventually you get onto the southeast ridge. And that ridge is where everyone, you get the traffic jams if there's a lot of people up there. Because you can only go signal file, you can't, there's... Yeah, a meter right. drop, and then just thousands of meters yeah. below you, so you can't just step past everybody. And that's where the bottlenecks next happen, and I'm sure everyone's read books and seen the movies of Everest and how many people oh, died in those bottlenecks yes. and get caught in the... Oh, yes. And, uh, and in fact, for all the followers, I can recommend a, 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 the most incredible book. It's a book written by a journalist, John Krakauer, mm -hmm. who uh, wrote... Uh, uh, who entitled the book uh, uh, Into Thin Air. Mm. It was Into Thin Air. And that was uh, oh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, I don't know, where a whole lot of people perished uh, on Mount Everest because the weather had changed yep. in a jiffy and there were people stuck at the Hillary yeah. Step because of the congestion and a lot of people died. So mm. you actually climbed into some very, very uh, hostile territory before you actually commenced your glide. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, going up to the top, that extra 800 meters is... Basically, if, if you're using oxygen and you run out of oxygen, you, it's like a fish out of water. You, you're going to die within a couple of hours if you don't have a, a, get your oxygen replaced. Um, and you won't have the energy to get down anyway. And anyone around you won't have the energy to help you down. Uh, maybe no, a Sherpa they, can, no. but they're, you know, they're, they're very strong No, I heard that there are people, people lying dead on the side of the, yes, uh, the, yeah, the my, path. Yes, my the teammate who went up, because I, I didn't go to the top, because uh, weather, weather was coming in, and I elected to rather fly off than go and summit, come down, and then maybe not be able to fly off. Yeah. So uh, I elected to, to let them go to the top, and I stayed, and then I, I, I managed to fly off. Um, but they said it was, uh, yeah, uh, it was quite uh, inspirational, well, amazing just to walk along that, that, uh, that from the Hillary step uh, up, to, up to the top. It was just really, I wish I'd done it. You know, I do have... Uh, no, I, I, uh, that's, that's just but, the way... Th the, but it was a choice. Yeah, Either yeah, no. I can always go back <laughs> and do it, where the flying, I might not be able to do it because the weather window, to get the weather right up there is... 10% chance that you're actually oh. going to get it right. So it's I'd the way that the cookie crumbles. Exactly, yeah. But now, let, to get going with this uh, incredible adventure, you climbed up there on your own. You never had a team of Sherpas carrying, uh, uh, carrying your rig and, uh, and your oxygen bottles and this and that. You did the climb yourself right yeah, up so to... They, so you, you joined... I, I joined what uh, they called an international expedition. So there's, there's people from around the world who don't have any mates or, or don't have a, a big team with them and you just join in so you have people from china from asia from india from japan from europe and you get there and hopefully you get on with everybody and i think most climbers uh, even though we've got egos we we you know, we all get on with each other but uh, and we managed to get on with each other and it was a great uh, bunch of guys and girls and uh, asian trekking then you get different high, different sort of costs in in climbing uh, Everest, and you get the over a million rand, and you get the five hundred thousand rand. So I, I, I don't. I'm not a rich person. I went for the five hundred thousand rand one, sort of an expensive uh, middle car sedan. That's what I thought I could afford, and uh, I, I went for that. And, th and they just provide the basics. They provide tents up the mountain, so you don't have to carry a tent with you. They provide your services at base camp, keep you comfortable, and they feed you at base camp, uh, and then. From base camp up to the top of Everest, uh, they then provide you with a climbing Sherpa who basically is like a shadow. And he shadows you, and if you really come unstuck, he'll hopefully have the energy to help you. 
So it's like, it's like a, a second chance in a way. Right. Um, and he, uh, you carry your own sleeping bags and uh, you do carry your own oxygen, like I like you said. Uh, carried, my, obviously, my glider. Um, and he really just carries uh, there's some dehydrated food. That's about it, really. And, and he might have an extra oxygen bottle just in case yours runs out. Uh, and that's about it, really, yeah. So it, it was tough going to get up there. It is tough, yeah. I know. And yeah. They, they do provide ropes all the way as well, so they do all the rope fixing for okay. you. And that's done for all the expeditions there. Uh, there's a, a team called the Rope Doctors, and they fix the rope from base camp through the, the, the famous icefall, which is probably the most dangerous yes. part. The Kumbu, the Kumbu, Kumbu, icefall, Kumbu yeah. icefall, right, yeah. Um, and that's, you do that early, 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 early in the morning, like 3, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning while, when the, everything's frozen solid. Um, and that's like a jungle gym of ice, basically, climbing in and out and through and down crevasses and up ladders. And they just put the ladders just to speed things up just so uh, you don't get bottlenecks and stuff. Um, and once you then you get onto the, what they call the, uh, the Western Coombe, which is basically a big valley that goes all the way up to the, the Lotsi face, where your second camp is. And uh, once you're up through the icefall, then it's pretty easy going uh, to the second camp. And then from the second camp, you go to camp three, uh, which is on the Lotsi face. And then from camp three, you go to the South Col, which is camp four. Right. And then from there, you summit. Now, this, this whole build up has taken about seven and a half weeks for yeah. you to get from wherever you started to the top and ready to jump seven and a half weeks. Yeah. And what follows was over within 20, 20 minutes. minutes. 20 Great. minutes, okay. So, so you've, you've got up to the top over here, and how are you monitoring the weather? I was talking about 120 knot and 150 knot winds, mm. and, uh, and uh, this was with the John Krakauer experience, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, into thin air. It was the wind that came in as well that devastated yeah. everybody. How, where are you getting your MET information from? How are you able to process it and think, uh, uh, whether this is a good idea to jump off the mountain or rather to go back to your tent. Okay, so um, Asian Trekking and, and a lot of the, the trekking companies and, and guys who provide all the, the support to the climbers um, have various MET offices around the world. There's a couple in Switzerland, there's uh, a guy in America. Um, I think there's about five of them and, you, and they pay them, you're paying your money, they pay them and they get the weather. And, Asian Trekking had two, two uh, uh, Met guys giving him information just so he could double check and make sure that it's not uh, and, getting... Uh, and they're giving you the, the weather. They're giving what they predicted, and they've been doing this for up at the uh, a lot of step, years. Yeah, right. and they're giving weather all the way down, every That's thousand That's what I meters. wanted to ask. You, you, you're going you're to go through, through zones, basically. Yes, yeah, yeah. There's, there's the, 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 the launch then there's the mid-zone, and, and then, then there's, there's the, the landing. Exactly. And at the weather, you have to have a it's good different idea. different each, at each sort of thousand meters, you're going through different layers. Absolutely. And you can actually see it you know, in the different yeah. cloud layers as you and come And you up. need to know about it. Yeah, yeah. And the rest is just experience and airmanship, eh? Basically, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is a good idea, or this it is looks a bad okay, idea? Yeah, it looks okay, or it doesn't look okay. And that's... Uh, okay, yeah. right. And so now... You've got a couple of guys that are helping you, and you're lined up, and you're ready to go down the coal, the southern coal, is that right? The south coal. So the south coal is a big saddle between right. uh, saddle. Yeah, Everest right. and, and Lotsi. Um, and uh, that's where you launch to go to the summit, or you launch to go flying in my case. And you're going to run like the wind, all right. You're going to run downhill, and your... Uh, your uh, 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 parachute is going to inflate, yep. and then as soon as it's able to generate enough lift, off you go. That's correct, yeah. Okay, so now... But that's a basic principle. <laughs> the, the thing that... Uh, I know what it's like to fly up there at 25, 30,000 feet. The yeah. air is so very, very thin, and, and the aerodynamics are entirely different. And uh, basically, you've got to move any lifting device through the air, uh, through the air a lot faster mm. That's uh, correct, yeah. than you would at lower levels yeah. because, because the density of the air is, is yeah. so low. So 
the, the, when you look at any lifting device, you, you, you look at the curvature of this thing. That, that gives you the coefficient of lift or the coefficient mm. of drag. Mm. All right. Yeah. Then you look at the density of the air. You look at the speed at which you uh, are achieving squared. Yeah. Uh, the speed multiplied by the speed and then the surface area. So I'm assuming that because of this very, very thin air that you are going to need a, 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 a rig that has far greater surface area and, uh, and um, a, a, a higher span. Yeah. Uh, were you able to use the good old faithful rig that you'd been using all over the show? No, in, in paragliding you, you have different, different uh, gliders in terms of, of safety and performance. And the, the more performance you get, your safety factor drops off. So, and you normally fly with a, um, a backup, a reserve, in case you get structural failure or um, you get really bad turbulence. You can actually throw your... And you wear that? You, you wear that some of, under the seat. Sometimes you have it just in front of you. Right. Um, and that's just you know, for worst case scenario, give you a second chance. Um, and that's just a round reserve that pops open or a, um, a Regello type uh, uh, reserve. So at least you have some sort of directional Regello, control. Regello, uh, would that be a triangle? A triangle, yes. yeah, a triangle reserve. It just gives you a little bit so you can get right. away from something if right. you have to, like a power line or a cliff, mountain cliff, yes. or whatever. Um, and then uh, the size of the wing is what you are talking about now, is, is what size the, the, to take because of the altitude, area, the surface yeah. area. Yeah. Whether, whether it's the cord, the cord, yeah. in other words, from the leading the edge and to the, the trailing yeah. edge, or whether and it's the span. The span. Yeah. Right. So I, I looked at that and I thought, the winds on Everest, it, I doubt there's going to be no wind there. There's going to be wind and probably too much wind. So I, instead of getting a, a glider bigger, I, I actually just kept this, what I normally fly. But I did go down to a safer glider, and I went down to what we call an A. And I then took, put the reserve aside. I didn't take a reserve with me. Because an A glider, um, they meant to, if, they get, if you get a big collapse, which is most likely when you're flying from 8,000 meters, you can, might go through a shear layer or something, and the glider might get folded up. And uh, you want something that you can open up again. And, uh, right. they'll, they'll, and structurally, they, structural failure is very... Uh, Okay. Maybe you've got a 1% right. chance of structural so failure. They're, they're tested no. to sort of 12 Gs, these, these wings. So. And it, but so it, it was a factor, the, 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 the choice of, uh, yes, of, yeah, of, yeah, yeah. of, of your vehicle. Yeah. That was it a was factor. It was a factor. And, and it's because it's just a right. glider by itself, very light. The guys who made it, uh, Nova, um, they come from Austria. And uh, so it's a very light glider. It weighs two kilograms, packs down to sort of smaller than your sleeping bag. My word. Um, Right. And 2.1 kilograms, you, you add a little harness, which is almost like a little bikini, uh, with no, you know, normally you're flying with padding at the back for your back in case you land badly, if you're flying like here at home. You've got a big glide and big harness that you sit in, which is all pod harness for aerodynamics and warmth. So I just went for the very simple little uh, bikini because it's light and that, and my, that harness And 20 minutes of freezing. And 20 minutes of freezing, but you aren't freezing, you're in a huge down suit. It's like a Michelin man when you're trying to okay. run. Um, but yeah, getting back to right. So now taking off. you're standing there. You're looking down the mountainside. You've got your pals helping you. You deploy your uh, 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 your, your, your paraglider. Yeah. That is deployed. You you can feel the wind over here, and you know that you're going to set sail down the mountain, and you're going to run like the wind. Yep. Right. You're going to run like the wind until such time that, uh, that, that uh, your paraglider is generating enough lift for you to say goodbye to, yeah. uh, you, to terra firma. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So the factors uh, that I was hoping for was fairly strong wind, because then I wouldn't have to run so much. Right. Um, that's on takeoff. Uh, on landing, I was hoping for no cloud. Okay, so I could see where I was going to land and uh, um, grass. So the only place I found grass below base camp, uh, because at that altitude you're landing at uh, five and a half thousand meters, almost the top of Kilimanjaro. Right. You're going to be coming in a lot faster than you would at sea level. Absolutely. Um, and again, you, you, you're hoping that there's wind in the valley, uh, and there's a nice valley breeze coming up, which there was that day, which helped me, but it, I still landed pretty fast and hard. Um, and 
you also have to worry, as we discussed earlier, is the, the different weather layers. So when I woke up at 6 o'clock, we got up, we went and had a look, and the wind on takeoff was a nice 20 k's an hour, which is perfect. The paraglider can comfortably take off in 20, comfortably take off in 30. Yes. After that, at, at sort of Joburg level or sea level, it then starts getting too strong, and you're then going to get dragged all over the place, uh, and it becomes very dangerous. So, so uh, once you had got airborne, you had to navigate your way down because heaven forbid you should make it a turn into a, into a, a, a dead end, uh, you know, where where uh, there was no other place to yes, go. Sir. So, how did you plan your route, or, or was it was it well marked from wear and tear from the thousands of people that walk no, up? No, you're down so high there? up you can't even see. You know, you can just see little like little ants. It's, it's, right. it's you're so high. Um, but it, it is luckily Everest is it is a dead end. It's a sort of a, a, a dog leg cul de sac. So you've got mountains on either side of you, and you go down, and you can either fly into the mountain there or turn left and just follow the valley out. And and the mountains, it, it, so it's easy from that perspective. You can see where you are. Um, but just the landing and how far. Oh, so you it it you say it it it, it looked fairly obvious. As yeah, to no, it is it was it is very obvious. Yeah. Um, but the problem is you don't know how far you've got to, you've got to fly to Gorka Shep, which as a crow flies isn't that far, it's maybe 10 k's away, but you're doing a dog leg, so it's sort of, I guess, uh, 15 kilometers away. Uh, and when I took off, that was all in cloud. So I didn't know where it was, it was under the cloud. So I just want to ask you something here. You're talking about Gorka Shep, that's where, yeah. you, that's that's where, where landed. you eventually landed. Yeah. Had you planned on that from the word go because of the nature of base camp with its uh, congestion and tents and rubble and all the terrible pictures you see of base camp. Yeah. Uh, and, and to me, it's fairly obvious that you couldn't land over there. There was just too... It, uh, too uh, I, I, I can't recall seeing any nice... Flat surface. No, there's no flat surface that there. You there's land on. there's so, just big rocks. Right. You know, stuff where you're gonna break a leg, twist an ankle, fall over and smack your head. Exactly. Um, so you decided on Gorka Ship from the word go. Yeah, I, I, I did think of base camp as an emergency landing in case I didn't make it there for whatever reason and my sink rate was very high. Right. It would be a, an emergency landing there. You know, there is a path sort of down the middle of it so where the, the rocks are a bit smaller. Um, and you just hope that the wind is really strong so that you can land a bit gently. Cause That's I, at Gorka Ship? No, no, at, at, at Base Camp. At Base Camp, right. G Gorka Ship, I, I looked at it when we were walking up and I went back there. When you're at Base Camp, you got, you know, you're there for almost two months. So you, you, so you walked down, you walked down and had a look and I found a grassy knoll sort of above Gorka Ship. Gorka Ship. There's, there's a nice river, river bed, which is with nice normal river sand, um, except it was in the lee of quite a big uh, hill. And if you get a strong valley breeze blowing up, I thought, oh, there might be a rotor coming off that, and it might be nice to land in, but as you're coming into land at 20 meters, you don't want your glider to, yeah. to fold up on you. So, so Gorka Ship is 700 foot lower than, uh, uh, than yeah, base roughly, camp, about yeah, 700 yeah, foot. Yeah. So you very definitely knew that all things being normal and running according to, uh, to what you'd planned, you would, you would uh, overfly or bypass uh, base camp and you would continue down to Gorka Ship. Yeah. Is it inhabited Gorka Ship? Yeah, there's a, a little couple of uh, um, sort of, I guess, tea houses. And uh, yeah, it's actually just tea houses there. I think there's about three or four of them. Uh, and it's really just during tourist season that, that they open. Right. Um, and, you know, I could have flown further, but I had to go back and get all my, my kit. Uh, so I could have flown further down the valley for probably another... Uh, I guess 20 k's I probably would have got. But there was no point, easy. really. Yeah, no, so then I would have to walk all the way back to right. you, so I decided just to yes. land there. And, um, and, um, uh, and it was the first place with grass, so that's why I chose it. So up on the, above Gorka Shep, there was this little plateau, uh, and it had grass on it, and it was quite soft, sort of like that tundra, which was yes. quite softy, muddy type, and I thought that's perfect for a hard landing. Okay. And, uh, yeah. I, I just want to come back to these different zones that you flew through, and then you talked about you talked about an L-shaped uh, uh, approach to to the uh, to the main mountain, etc., yeah. etc. Et I uh, have heard so much about these deadly rotors. 
you know, that yes. grab hold of, uh, of uh, the paraglider and, and uh, they, they uh, uh, cause a collapse Correct, yeah. of the actual chute. Mm. Um, you can't see these things. You don't know that they're there. What, what is the best you can do to minimize the risk of flying through an area where there is a rotor? Okay, well, generally it boils down to the weather. So we got our weather from, from our weather experts from around the world, and it was relayed to base camp, and they then relayed it up to me, and they said, the, number one, the, the uh, jet stream has moved off, and it had moved off for two weeks. So we had a two-week window without a jet stream. Uh, and that's the strong wind of 100 plus kilometers an hour, yeah. Um, so that was number one. Once that moves off, the general wind is just thermal-driven wind that is drawn up so the mountain, thermals go up the mountain and it just sucks in the valley air and that's your general wind. So you don't have to worry about wind coming, uh, you know, northeaster constant yes. blowing through. We didn't have to worry about that so much. No. Um, now, because of the L-shaped and you've got Lotzi and the puts, there was a bit of wind coming up their side and on, obviously on the leeward side of those mountains, there was a bit of turbulence and I did feel some of that. In my video, you can see the glider getting bounced around, but it wasn't enough to, uh, right. uh, to cause collapses. Right. Um, and then your landing, obviously they don't have a wind sock up there. How did you determine the wind and ensure that you would land into the wind? So generally, you're flying in big mountains, uh, the wind's going to be coming up the valley. Right. That's just uh, number one sort of rule. Uh, unless there's a, 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 a foon or a berg wind blowing for some reason. But I actually don't think you, I wonder if you get that in the, the Himalayas. I don't think so. It's just too big. Um, but... Uh, uh, I had a, I just use my, my smartphone and you get various flying apps and this one gives you your, uh, your airspeed, this worked on, on when you do a, a circle, it'll then work out where the wind's coming from and your drift and everything and then it gives you an estimated airspeed. That's amazing. And, and your, obviously your ground speed, yes. which was more important to me was my ground speed and what, how fast I'd have to be running when I hit the ground. Right. Uh, and. From that, when you get over your landing zone, so I got over Gorkashep, I was still high, I was sort of maybe 2,000 meters above it. Uh, I just do a couple of 360s. The computer then works out, okay, the wind is definitely coming up the valley. Uh, your, air, your, your ground speed going with the wind, I think I hit around about 90 kilometers an hour. So I knew the wind, and my glider I know flies at around about 38 kilometers an hour. Right. So I've got a good uh, sort of 60 or 55 kilometer wind down there. Uh, well, up where I am. And obviously, as you go down, the wind gradient gets less and less. Uh, the wind should drop off. Um, so coming to land was, uh, I knew it was going to be fast. And you, you come in, and I probably hit the ground, I guess, at about, even after I'd fared, probably about 30 k's an hour. So I had, to, I had to run and sprint, and I couldn't right. keep up with my big boots, and I ended up falling over. But it was fine. It was right. nothing. It was nice, soft landing. Uh, oh, that's terrific. E easy in my in my. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. No. What an absolute adventure and what guts and courage you have to take on something like this. I'm full of admiration for you. I, uh, I understand that your plan is to uh, uh, fly off the highest mountain in each and every continent. And so far you have done five out of seven. And could you just run through the five mm. that you have yeah, so done? Yeah, so six, I've done six of them out of the seven, yeah. Okay, six But they, they wouldn't let me fly off uh, Denali, Mount McKinley in North America. They, they confiscated my paraglider there. For what reason they wouldn't give it? They just, it's a national park in America. You aren't allowed to do anything in national parks besides, I think, just look at the mountains. Um, so, yeah. So we went and we climbed it, but we, we weren't allowed to fly off. And it was a beautiful day when we got up there to fly off as well. It would have been really, really spectacular. So we've done, uh, just going through the seven continents, there's uh, Africa, which is Kilimanjaro. We've flown off that one. There's uh, North America, which is Denali, which they didn't uh, let me fly off. There's South America, which is Aconcagua. That's 7,000 meters. Uh, there's Europe, which is uh, Ilbris in Russia. And that's uh, just under 6,000 meters. Um, then there is uh, Karsten's Pyramid, uh, which is in Papua New Guinea. And that's the, uh, not the Asian continent, uh, the Australasian continent. 
Uh, it's a bit of a dispute there between Papua, the one in Papua New Guinea or the one in Australia. But it's the area and the zone yeah, and whatever yeah. is so there. I, right. Anyway, I, I went and did both those yeah. mountains, the one in Australia and the one yes. in Papua New Guinea. And then I've just done Everest, which is in uh, uh, the, uh, I can't think of the continent now, the Russian continent, whatever it's called. Uh, anyway, it's gone from my head. Um, the Asian continent. Urals. No, no, Urals is Russia. Uh, so Russia. The, the Asian oh, the continent. Asian. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. And that, right. that's Everest. And so I've just got Antarctica to do, which is uh, Mount Vincent. Right. right. And that's going to be a challenge because of whiteouts and definition and, uh, and seeing things differently. It's definitely going to be the coldest, I yeah, think, out of all of for them. For sure. Uh, and the winds there, it's not going to be a wind like you get on a big mountain where it sort of generates its own wind. Uh, there's going to be a constant breeze, a wind that yes. comes through yes. from a certain direction. Yes. And if a front comes in, it might change. So it's, it's going to be a bit more trickier, that one. So now. besides being very, very brave, all right, and being uh, very experienced and having this talent, you have to be your own meteorologist and your own navigator. There are a multitude of skills that come into this, and you've got to master yeah, I guess you them get, You get an overview, like right. on Everest, we've got an overview of the weather, but I only took off, from trying to take off at 6 o'clock, I only took off at 12 o'clock. And the weather closed in at, I think it was about half past one. Wow. So I just made it off. Yes. Uh, there. And, and that was, you know, at base camp it was clouded in at six o'clock, but the wind on top was fine. So when it's clouded in, how do you penetrate uh, these clouds uh, you, and, 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 well, uh, I, I and maintain your equilibrium? Because, because in, in normal aircraft, uh, unless you are skilled in the art of flying... Uh, 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 an aeroplane yeah, instrument on, on its rated. instruments, yeah. then uh, you've got a couple of seconds, seconds yeah, before so, yeah. vertigo overtakes you. And, and so, uh, luckily, a paraglider, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a like pendulum, a pendulum. Like a pendulum. So, right. it'll always be flying straight and level. Right. So, you've got that. The only thing is your disorientation yes. uh, that disappears. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and you fly with your little ball and compass, so you keep it. You don't, you don't rely on your instrument there. I don't rely my GPS. I've tried it. I got horribly lost in the clouds. The ball, the old, so you, you the did, old you, ball. So you went into cloud from time to time? Uh, yeah, through Everest we flew, I flew through the cloud, but I'm, in other flights in my, right. my sort of 34 years of flying, I have flown in clouds and, and the, the GPS is just too sensitive and I find a ball, a ball is actually, you know, you can keep east yes. or west or whatever direction you yes. want to go a lot easier than trying to follow a GPS arrow. Right. Um, Anyway, so we had all the, I had all those with me, um, but luckily I didn't fly through the cloud for too long on Everest, but uh, we had to wait until uh, at 10 o'clock the cloud started breaking up, so you can see little pockets that you can actually go over and then spiral down through okay, them, and then you right. can see, visually see where oh. you're going. But then the wind was too strong on top, and eventually at 12 o'clock it dropped down to about 40 k's, 45 k's an hour for me to take off, which was, I thought I was going to be dragged all over the place, but luckily, because it was so high, I pulled the wing up and I actually had to run, you know. Right. <laughs> that sort of weather in Joburg, it, I wouldn't take off in. Yes. It would be a no-no, uh, but uh, up there it was slightly different, and I actually had to run a good 20, 30 meters oh. at 8,000 meters, which might be a record in itself, I don't know. <laughs> it was hard work. 20 minutes later, it was all over. And 20 minutes later, yeah. it was, was, was over, yeah. 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 Pierre, you're a real go-getter, and uh, you, you just lap up any challenge that is put in your way. I, we would like to know what plans you have for the future. What is cooking in that head of yours, and what are you going to be doing next? So, um, the, at the moment, the, we were going to go and try and fly um, over K2, which is the second highest mountain Correct. in the world, in the Karakoram in Pakistan. And we're doing that in June. It's been attempted, uh, I think, twice before now. And there was a Red Bull team that went this last season. And they got uh, to 7,500 meters on K2. Um, and that's flying. You start flying 40 Ks away uh, on the Baltora Glacier. And you fly up the Baltora Glacier to the, to the um, confluence, and then you go on to Broad Peak and jump onto K2. So that's what we're going to be trying in, in June. And uh, there's a team of four of us, uh, three South Africans and one, uh, one British uh, friend. Um, and I hope we, we're successful, but we'll see. Yeah, it's going to be a good adventure. Oh. So. 
And no. do, are you also superstitious about uh, Mount Annapurna? Because I know a lot of climbers have perished on that mountain, and they say it's unpredictable. It's, 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 uh, I don't know if I'm superstitious about it, but it's, it's probably the most dangerous it is, mountain eh? out, of, out of the four. Not for nothing. Not for nothing. Not, not for nothing. It's just, uh, it's just at a certain angle where you get a lot of avalanche uh, um, problems, so a big avalanche, avalanche risk on that mountain. Yeah. So, but I'm, I'm not uh, interested. You're I'm, stay I'm, away too, from I'm me. too old to go and climb the 14,000 meter peaks. So I'd, I'd rather try and fly up them. That'll be, that'll be more appealing to me. There's a thing, eh? No. <laughs> There's a thing. Yeah, I want to wish you well. We all, oh, thanks, we all, the oh. entire fraternity, we wish you well in your further endeavors. And it's, uh, it's lovely to talk to a guy that is full of pure grit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you and uh, Clint Eastwood would get on very, very <laughs> well. And... Uh, um, uh, well done, and uh, as I say, we wish you well in further endeavours, mm -hmm. and it's been a great pleasure talking to you and learning so much about what you have offered to us. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very much. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you very much. Good.